Good morning, church, and a very, very warm welcome to you. So good to see you in the house this morning. I want to encourage you, if you're sitting right in the back, to please come up a little bit uh, closer. Um, it just helps us <laughs> as we minister here this morning. Uh, I want to just encourage you this morning from a short passage of Scripture. This is speaking about when uh, Jesus was making his way down during Palm Sunday, and it's taken from Luke 19. This is the NLT version. It says, When he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in, highest, in the highest heaven. This morning, I'm sure each and every one of us here can find something that we can praise God for. I love that they took, they, it was a selfless act. You know, if you read before that, it said they took out their coats, they threw it on the, on, on the cult that Jesus was uh, coming on. They had prepared the way. This morning, even as we stand up, as we get ready to praise and worship, we're going to be ushering the presence of God into this place. And I know that each and every one of us have something to be thankful to God for. And sometimes it's not about the very big things. It's about the little things. You know, a few weeks back, uh, we were in Gateway. Uh, we had taken Olivia uh, just for a little playtime. And we so happened to be there at the same time that the robbery took place at the jewelry store. And uh, we had walked down to the bottom, and that's when it had begun. And uh, within seconds, we had to um, start running uh, up the escalator and find a place to hide because we just heard people screaming and running not knowing exactly what happened and we hid in a stall of the family toilet and within seconds after that there was just gunshots happening and in that moment of time all I could think about was praying grabbing my two-year-old and starting to pray and I thank God that I had the name of Jesus to call upon and I had a hope that I, I could call upon amen and this morning, I'm so encouraged never to take life lightly and never to take it for granted. Um, you know, and we want to take each and every moment that we have to give glory to the God that does such amazing things in our lives. And sometimes we don't even realize the things he protects us from. Uh, it's not only the things that he gives us, but the things that he holds back from us at times, amen, that we think are supposedly good, but they're actually harmful, harmful for us. So this morning, let's rise to our feet. Let's get ready to praise the King of Kings. Let's usher his presence into this place this morning. I'm so grateful that we have this space between us so we can get free, lift up our hands, and, and have that freedom to worship him how we love to express ourselves. So over to you, Stan. Thanks. Can we give the Lord a hand of praise this morning? Amen. Come on, clap your hands as loud as you can and give our King some praise. Welcome to church this morning. It's good to be found in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Can you point at somebody? Maybe just wave your finger at them. Tell them it's good to see you here this morning. Probably maybe just wave behind you, all around you. Welcome to the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. God is good. We magnify your name, O oh God. Be glorified.
give him a praise offering for he is worthy to be praised. Are you excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Blessed be the name of the Lord. We bless your name, O God. We magnify, we glorify you, Jesus. We magnify your name. We stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He And together we sing
as we have our hands raised to him this morning. Father, we thank you for your blood. We thank you for, your, for the cross of Jesus Christ. We thank you for salvation this morning. Thank you, Lord, that we can be found in your presence to lift up our hands to you and to glorify and to magnify your name this morning. If you come this morning, if you had a difficult week or a difficult morning, I want you to know that you are in the presence of the Lord. And the Bible says where, where two or three are gathered this morning, here he's in the midst to bless. And in the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. There, at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore this morning. So even as you come in and as you lift your hands to him this morning, we bless you, Jesus. We magnify. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. We magnify your name. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid. Bearing all my sin and shame, in love you came. Gave amazing grace. Thank you for
Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. We give you glory. We magnify you, Lord. For you are worthy to be praised. We give you glory and honor. We worship you, Lord, as you worship him this morning. He is seated on the throne. He is high and lifted up. We magnify, we glorify. King Jesus, you are worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. We love you, Lord. We bless your name. Thank you, Jesus. For your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I, I will say of the goodness of God your voice you have led me through the fire in darkness light you are close like no other I know you as a father I know you as a friend and I have learned in the goodness
Can we celebrate His goodness this morning? Can we celebrate His love? Oh, we worship you. Can we celebrate who He is to us this morning? We love you, Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. We magnify your name, oh God. We glorify. Then sings my soul, my Savior God. Thou art, how great Thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to How great, how great are you this morning, Jesus? Oh, thank you, Father. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Come on. Oh, we worship you this morning, Jesus. We worship you today, oh God. It says, my soul, my mind, my will, my emotions this morning. Oh, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you, Jesus. How great you are, God. How great you are, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. How great you are, Jesus, this morning. Some of you this morning need to say that. Mind, will, and emotions come into alignment this morning. Jesus. This morning we choose to say how great you are, Father. How great you are. There's a sweet presence in the room this morning. The Father wants to remind some of you this morning that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. 
He doesn't make mistakes. Some of you may have felt that. But this morning I want to just reaffirm what the Father would like you to hear. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. So be still and know that I am God. Father, we want to thank you this morning. That you love us so much. You meet us at the point of our needs. And this morning we count it a privilege to gather in your name and to worship you and bless you and say that you are good, good Father. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and we commit the rest of this meeting into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated for a short while. Well, if you're visiting with us for the first time, a big, big welcome to you this morning. Thank you for choosing to fellowship here at Access Church. We count it a privilege to have you here this morning. A few notices of some upcoming events that have been happening. Today is the second session of our discovery track. If you didn't make it to the first one, you're still welcome to join in on the second one because we'll do a catch-up session of the first one. Our discovery track is basically, if you've been visiting here, you'd like to know more about the house, the vision, values, what, the, uh, what God has called this house to do in the city. You'd like to discover more about your gifts, talents, we encourage you to come and join us. It's four classes, so today would be the second class of the four weeks. It meets at 4 p.m., 4 through to 6. If you'd like to join in, please register at the welcome desk um, after service. Our midweek prayer at 7 p.m. on a Wednesday. We've been having some amazing time in God's presence. I encourage you to come and be a part of that. Then on Saturday, we are hosting a wellness clinic here for the community, the surrounding community. Um, there'll be many services offered. One of it, MI7, will be providing registered nurses that will be doing basic checkups for those that are coming. We'll be having Kaufman Brothers doing a talk on um, uh, mammograms for the ladies. We also got um, a doctor that will be coming and speaking about post-COVID recovery. Also just taking away some of the myths regarding vaccinations. Uh, we'll also be having the um, South African blank, uh, blood bank services coming and so if you are a blood donor we encourage you to please come out and donate they are in need of uh, blood at this moment there is a shortage also on the 23rd of october the men in the house can i hear uh hey! <laughs> okay on the 23rd of october all the men we're going to have an out there's an outing that's going to be held for you at the midmar dam there's details up on the screen at the back there please register i want to encourage every man in the house to please come on it's going to be an amazing time for you to fellowship get to know one another build relationships and just have some fun so there is going to be some good food uh, there's breakfast and lunch provided and um, that's always good because we have an amazing hospitality team that serves us in uh, front of your seat in the chair in front of you there's a connection card if you're visiting with us i want to encourage you to please fill that out we want to get your details and just be in contact with you there's also an option to fill a prayer request we'd like to join you in prayer if you have a need uh, and we bring that before the lord on a wednesday as well we have opened our coffee bar, uh, so please take advantage of that. There's cappuccino, lattes, and some other good stuff that's uh, going to be provided. There's also free coffee available, so please don't rush off. Have a cup of tea or coffee and enjoy our time of fellowship. I want to also um, remind you that there's still COVID protocols that we got to follow and to please keep your mask on during the service, not only for your safety, but for those around you. Uh, we have an amazing serve team that is available for, um, for you. So if you need to know where the parents' room or toilets are, please um, check in with them. I'd like us to join our faith this morning and pray for a few requests. First, we want to pray for those that are sick in body this morning. Uh, there's Shane that is in high care. One of the ladies that are in our fellowship, that's her son. There's also a request for a prayer play who is battling with cancer. We want to bring him before the Lord. And there are still some families that are mourning the loss of a loved one. So we want to pray for the Lord to heal them. 
and give them the strength and the grace. We also want to pray for our nation at this time. There is a prophetic promise of our nation, and we want to um, bring our nation before the Lord, especially with the upcoming local elections. And we want to trust God for revival in our nation, that there'll be good godly leaders that are placed into positions of authority. So won't you please stand up this morning? Let us join our faith and pray this morning. If you're perhaps sick in your body this morning and you're here, would you also please um, stand in faith this morning? We serve a great and mighty God. And we never want to take this moment in time for granted. As we join our faith together, there's power in prayer this morning. And if you, are, if you have any infirmity in your body this morning, bring it before the Lord. Father, we want to thank you this morning. As a band of believers, Lord, we put our faith in you today. Lord, we thank you today for your promises that say, Father, when we gather in your name, you show up. Lord, when we put our faith together with 203, God, call upon your name, you are there. And that, Father, whatever we ask in your name, Lord, so shall it be done according to your word. And so we thank you today that we ask for healing, Lord, that, Father, you come through, you show up. So we bring shame before you, we bring prayer before you. And if there's anybody else here today in this auditorium that is suffering, Lord, health-wise, have an infirmity, Father, we take authority over that in the mighty name of Jesus, and we release healing into their bodies. Father, we thank you that you bring doctors and nurses, Lord, in the pathways of those that are in hospital today, and that there will be a voice of encouragement, a voice of hope, Lord. And I thank you today that, Father God, for those that, Lord, are still um, dealing with loss, Father, they're mourning a loved one. Jesus, you are the strength. Holy Spirit, you're the comforter. Would you be their portion would you help them, Lord, day by day as they go on, Lord, through the process, Father God. And, Lord, that you would strengthen them and encourage them that you are their hope, that you, that you love them, and that, Lord, even through this season that you will bring them through. I thank you that you bring, Lord, joy. Lord, that you bring beauty out of ashes and you bring joy, Lord, when there's tears and mourning. So I thank you today that you would comfort them and strengthen them. Father, we pray for our nation at this time. We are reminded of the prophetic word of our nation that revival will will uh, will start father god lord in every province and our nation will see revival from the tip of africa all the way through father god this continent so we thank you today lord that our nation is on your heart father so we pray for the upcoming elec uh, local elections that they'll be peaceful we pray lord god that godly men and women would be placed into positions of authority so we pray for our nation lord for revival that'll be a godly na nation it'll be a nation of peace father and Lord, even as we come to the time of the word, we pray that our hearts be opened. Father, your word is anointed, and Lord, when it's released, it'll accomplish that which it's sent forth. So I thank you that you know every need in this room today, and you'll minister to every heart. So we ask, Lord God, that you enable us, take away every distraction today, let our hearts be open, let our spirits be opened to hear what you have to say to us this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. God bless you. you. May be seated as we open our hearts this morning to God's word. Would you put your Would you please you know, um, turn your attention to the screen? media tonight? We look at those filters on platforms like Instagram that can radically change our online appearance. Are they contributing to what a Facebook whistleblower this week called a toxic environment for teens? Here's ABC's Ariel Reshef. They're not real, but they've never looked more lifelike. They can be fun, <laughs> sometimes a bit scary, oftentimes beautiful. Camera filters powered by augmented reality or AR at the fingertips of millions, able to give us that polished look. Some now asking, are filters creating a warped standard of beauty? I believe Facebook's products harm children, stoke division, and weaken our democracy. This week on Capitol Hill, Francis Haugen, a former product manager in civic integrity for Facebook, came forward, testifying the tech giant knew about harmful effects caused by its apps, including Instagram's potentially toxic effect on some teenage girls, and did nothing. I would like to emphasize one of the documents that we sent in on problematic use examined the rates of problematic use by age, and that peaked with 14-year-olds. They say explicitly, 
I feel bad when I use Instagram and yet I can't stop. CEO Mark Zuckerberg breaking his silence, saying at the heart of these accusations is the idea that we prioritize profit over safety and well-being. That's just not true. He also wrote that research found that for many struggling teens, Instagram made those difficult times better rather than worse. With more than a million followers, TikTok sensation Teffy is known for her unvarnished opinions and says she because prides herself it. on keeping it real. All right, this is filler, under eye filler, eyelash extensions. I am someone who grew up on the internet and it totally skewed with my sense of confidence. Do you think we've completely lost touch with what a real body and a real face actually look like? I do feel like we're losing touch with what reality looks like, and it hurts me because I feel like reality is beautiful. If a cyborg is half human and half technology, I feel like we're already getting there to the point where we're expecting people to look as unhuman as possible. The effects, even from some of the simplest filters, are astonishing. These filters can go from the cute, the sweet, to the ridiculous, but are they creating a false sense of what we should actually look like? Lenses and filters like these are available on most popular social media platforms from Snapchat to Instagram. Users can now virtually apply makeup or enhance their appearance. I don't try to go over the top because I don't want to change so much. Manuel, a top AR artist, went viral for his Grinch filter. But even with his quirky creations, this one called Patricia, his line of work also comes with pressure to meet a certain demand. Sometimes I, you know, follow, I'll say, the trend. Social psychologist Aaron Vogel says beauty filters can be alienating and create a sense of unattainable perfection. And getting used to seeing themselves that way because filters are so commonplace now. Experts say what starts out making you feel good can be damaging to self-esteem. We also get a self-esteem boost from other people's reactions. The American Academy of Facial Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery cautions while beauty filters can be fun, they've also contributed to a surge in demand for cosmetic procedures. 62% of plastic surgeons reported their patients wanted to go under the knife because of dissatisfaction with their social media profile. 57% said their patients wanted to look better in selfies on social media. The association warning if the results don't match that of a beauty filter, it could trigger body dysmorphia. I get a lot of young girls in my DMs, but and by young I mean like 13, 14, 15, that started to share with me they couldn't post a photo of themselves or a video to their Instagram stories or grid or anywhere on social media without a filter on. We reached out to Snapchat, a leader in AR filters, to see if they had any guidelines for usage. The company saying it rejects any lenses that mimic cosmetic surgery. Facebook, which owns Instagram, providing a similar statement, saying, We work closely with academics and organizations like the National Eating Disorders Association to develop policies that keep people safe and help those in need. For example, we ban effects that clearly promote eating disorders or that encourage potential potentially dangerous cosmetic surgery procedures. For Manuel, growing his platform means harnessing the opportunity to educate. I'm able now to set the trend. And instead of having a beauty filter, now we're going to have this learning filter, or we're going to have this game, or we're going to have this character. Talk to your children. You cannot disregard that it is affecting other people and how it might how it might affect the people that you love around you, but you just haven't talked to them about it. We can close the magazine and we can pa drive past the billboard, but we are on our phones all the time. Ariel Reshef, ABC News, New York. Now to the... Filters. They create a view of reality that doesn't quite exist. Yes, they can enhance. Yes, they can beautify, but they can also darken, they can distort, they can warp, they can twist, and they can blur reality. But whatever they do, they don't give us a true picture of reality. 
Now this morning, you may be thinking I'm going in the area of speaking about those type of filters, which you find on social media, those digital filters like on Snapchat and Instagram, but that's not where I'm going this morning. But the concept of those kind of filters is actually a good analogy to help us understand our subject matter for the next four weeks. You see, in the series that we're going to go and look at, we're going to be looking at four spiritual filters that the enemy uses to give us a distorted, a warped, a twisted, and a blurred view of reality. So yes, in the natural, we may know about these filters that sometimes we use on Snapchat or Instagram, but they are spiritual filters as well. And sometimes, or in actual fact, those are more dangerous to the filters spoken about in the video we just viewed. And over the next four weeks, we are going to be looking at how the enemy applies these filters in our lives, how these filters affect us, and how we can remove these filters so that we can really get a proper view and a proper perspective of reality. Because what the enemy does is he tries to show us a reality that doesn't really exist. And we begin to view, he, uh, view life through the filters that he places in front of us. So this morning, the first filter that we are going to be looking at is called the filter of doubt. The filter of doubt. So what exactly is doubt? And what are some of the symptoms of doubt? Well, doubt, according to the dictionary, is the state of being uncertain about the truth or about the reliability of something. It's a feeling of uncertainty or distrust. How many of you here have somewhere down the line had some doubts? Put your hand up. You see, all of us have experienced doubt somewhere down the line. You know, synonyms of the word doubt would be words like uncertainty, suspicion, indecision, and hesitation. While words which are the opposite to the word doubt would be words like certainty, conviction, confidence, and trust. So what does the Bible actually tell us about doubt? James chapter 1 from verse 6 to 8 says this, and I'm going to be reading from the New International Version. It says, But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Sounds like quite a harsh scripture. And yes, while we've all had our moments of doubt, there are some who really struggle in this area more than others. And so here are some of the symptoms of doubt that the Bible gives us based on the portion of scripture that we just read. The scripture says that the one who doubts is firstly like a wave of the sea. What does that mean? It means that one moment you can experience these super highs and the next moment you can crash and experience these downright lows. It's like you constantly find yourself on an emotional roller coaster, a wave of the sea. Secondly, it says that that person is blown and tossed by the wind. In other, in other words, you can be easily moved, you can be easily swayed, and you can also be very easily manipulated as well. Thirdly, it says that the one who doubts should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. So this morning, maybe if there's a lack in a certain area of your life this morning, whether that may be financial, maybe that may be relational, maybe that may be emotional, the root of that, of that struggle can sometimes be because of doubt. Next, it says that a person that such a person is double-minded. Do you ever find yourself being double-minded? 
Are you often in two minds about certain things? Do you have divided loyalties sometimes? Do you sometimes even, what the Bible calls, waver between two opinions? And lastly, it says that the one who doubts is unstable in all they do. What about you this morning? Do you sometimes struggle with stability in your life? Or maybe it's in just certain areas of your, your life. Maybe it's with keeping a job. Maybe it's with relationships. Do you have a problem with stability? Do you struggle with your Christian walk? And if you've, I, if you've identified any of these symptoms, I want to tell you that you are in the right place this morning if you've identified with any of those symptoms. Because this morning, a bit later on, I'm going to give you a key as to how do we remove this filter that the enemy tries to put in front of us that distorts the reality of life. And maybe you're here this morning and maybe you say, well, I haven't identified with any of those symptoms. Well, then I'm going to show you this morning how easy it is for doubt to creep and enter into our lives as well. So how does doubt enter? And in order to fully understand this, we need to go back to the fall of man. We need to go back to the book of Genesis, more specifically Genesis chapter 3. And this is where we are going to be looking at the fall of man and how the enemy used the filter of doubt to play a key role in this fall. And this is found in Genesis chapter 3 from verses 1 to 8. Many of you may be familiar with the story, but let's just go through this uh, again. If you don't have your Bible with you this morning, the scripture will be up on the screen. This is what it says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat, when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the, the Lord God among the trees in the garden. You see, from this portion of scripture that we've just read, we can see that doubt enters in when we allow the wrong voice or the wrong voices to speak into our lives. And in so doing, we allow, we allow the wrong words, which then become the wrong thoughts to enter into our minds. In the portion of scripture we just read, we see how Eve starts to engage in a conversation with a snake or a serpent, an animal which she was supposed to have dominion over or rule over. You see, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, this is what the Bible says. It says, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. You see, man was created to have dominion, to rule over the wild animals. But Satan comes in the form of a serpent, in the form of a snake, and instead of Eve refraining from engaging in that conversation, Eve begins to entertain what the devil starts to say. You see, we find that doubt enters in very, very subtly. When Eve allows Satan, who, as I said, comes in the form of a serpent, to slither in to her mind 
and to begin to twist God's word. And very often that is what snakes do when they want to kill their prey. They slither in and then they begin to twist and constrict. And that is the plan of the enemy. He wants to constrict. He wants to squeeze the life or the word of God out of our life. So how does the enemy apply this filter of doubt? Well, in the portion of scripture we just read, he does this by causing Eve to doubt three key things. Firstly, he causes her to doubt her ability to hear God's word. Notice that he says, did God really say? And that's what he does to you and I as well. He causes us to doubt our ability to hear the voice of God. It's like we sometimes say, maybe I didn't hear God properly. Maybe I didn't quite, maybe God wasn't really speaking to me. And that's the first tactic of the enemy, to doubt our ability to hear the voice of God. Secondly, he causes her to doubt God's word. He, doubt, he causes her to doubt what God says. Maybe what God said wasn't really true. He says, certainly you won't die. Certainly you will not die. When God clearly said to Eve, when you eat of this particular tree, you will die. And you see, that is what Satan tries to do. He tries to cause us to doubt the truth and the validity of God's word. That's his second tactic. So the first tactic, he, doubt, he causes us to doubt our ability to hear God's word. Secondly, he causes us to doubt God's very word. And then thirdly, he caused Eve to doubt God's character who God really is. He caused her to doubt the goodness of God. You know, we sang that song earlier, I will sing of your goodness or the goodness of God. You see, and instead of seeing God's restriction as his protection, the serpent twisted it and he wanted to see her to see God's restriction as God's rejection. You see, that is what we need to understand, that God's restriction in any area of our life is actually his protection. It's not his rejection. And he got her to almost view God as someone who was withholding something good from them. You know, and we know what God says. For God, it says, uh, you know, God told them not to partake of, of that tree, but Satan comes and he says, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You see, Eve began to even question herself because she was already made in the image of God. And this is Satan's strategy in our lives. This is the enemy, the devil's strategy. He plants the seed or he applies the filter of doubt. But, you know, why, why is doubt so harmful? Why is doubt so bad? Isn't it okay for us to have a bit of doubt? Well, doubt leads to other things, and this is the effects of doubt. You see, doubt has a domino effect. You see, doubt is the doorway to deception, and deception is the doorway to death. And that is the plan of the enemy. If he can get you to doubt, then it's very easy for him to get you to be deceived and deception eventually or ultimately will lead to your death. Not physically, but spiritually. And let's unpack that a bit. As I said, doubt is the doorway to deception. And because of Eve doubted, she was very easily deceived. In Genesis 3 verse 13, this is what, what happens. It says, then the Lord God said to the woman, what is it, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. You see, she was deceived because she gave in to the doubt. Revelation 12, 19 says this. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, 
who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. His angels speaking of his demons. And that is what we need to realize, that one of the strategies of the enemy is to deceive us, but the way he, gets, he, he, he starts to deceive us is through doubt. He planted the seed. He applied the filter. You see, the filter of doubt made us see something that was actually harmful as something that was harmless. You see, Genesis 3 verse 6 says this, When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it as well. It's interesting that she only noticed the fruit of the tree only after Satan started to cause doubt in her mind. I mean, the tree was there all along in the garden. Why only now does she begin to see that the fruit was good for food? It was because doubt began to enter into her mind. You see, the filter of doubt deceives you by making God appear bad and by making your sin appear good. You see, that is what doubt does. It deceives us. God appears bad and then sin appears good. That's the very strategy of the devil. It's like, man, it's just a little sin. It's not going to harm, it's not going to hurt you, but we don't realize the domino effect of that. That deception ultimately leads to death. So deception is the doorway to death. Genesis 2 from verse 16 to 17 says, And the Lord commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat it, you will certainly die. You see, they already knew this, but Satan brought that doubt into their minds. And how how do we know that they died? Well, they didn't die physically. Eventually they did. But the main area they died is they died spiritually. They lost that intimacy, that connection with God. In Genesis chapter 3 verse 24 it says, and he drove them, and he drove the man out, speaking of God, he placed on the east side of the garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. You see they had no access anymore to the tree of life. And that is how death began to enter. You see while Death is the fruit of deception. Doubt is the root of it. It all starts with doubt. So, how do we deal with doubt? How do we remove this filter? And even during a time like COVID, it's like, even amongst believers, doubt has so increased where there's a lot of things that we're beginning to question. And the best way of looking as to how can we remove this filter of doubt is to look at how Jesus handled it, because he's our best example. And so let's turn to Matthew chapter 4, reading from verse 1 to 11. Matthew 4 from verse 1 to 11. And this is the exact same thing that Adam and Eve experienced in the Garden of Eden that Jesus experiences here in the wilderness. It's Satan coming to test and to tempt him. But let's see how Jesus responds. Matthew 4 from verse 1 to 11, it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, what is he doing if you are the Son of God? He's trying to even make Jesus begin to question his identity. Are you really the son of God? Very, very subtle. If you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand 
on the highest point of the temple. Notice again what he says. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. How did Jesus respond every time? He responded with the word of God. I want you to say this after me. I want you to say, when in doubt, when in doubt. Get, your get your Bible out. You see, that is the key. That is how we remove the filter of doubt. When in doubt, get your Bible out. You see, we have a weapon that God has given us to overcome every doubt and it's called the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The sword of the spirit can destroy and remove every filter of doubt that tries to creep into our minds. You see, every time Satan tempted Jesus, he res Jesus responded with, it is written. He always responded with the word of God. He didn't entertain the devil which is what Eve began to do, try to explain things based on her own understanding. It's interesting that even Satan himself used scripture against Jesus. Because he also says in one of those uh, portions there, he says, uh, you know, for it, it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Do you know that Satan also knows scripture? But what he does is that he twists scripture and he also leaves parts of scripture out. And let's see what he left out when he quoted this scripture. This scripture that he used is actually found in Psalm 91 from verse 11 to 13. But the amazing thing is that when Satan quotes the scripture, he leaves out verse 13. So the full portion of the scripture actually says this. Psalm 91 from verse 11 to 13, it says, For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift, up, they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. But this is the part he left out. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Quite interesting that he left out the part about him. <laughs> and that's what Satan does. He even tries to confuse us with scripture. That is why we can't use scripture out of context. And we can't live our lives based on just knowing parts of scripture and not knowing the full gamut of scripture. You see, we as believers, we need to be full of the word of God. Psalm 119 verse 11 says this in the New King James Version. It says, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. You see, you and I as children of God, we need to hide the word of God in our heart. And how do we do that? By reading God's word, by studying the scripture, by memorizing the word, by meditating on the word. But how often do we do that and the fruit will show when we start to just be filled with doubt in our minds. How much time do we actually spend in Scripture? James chapter 4, verse 7 to 8 says this. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You see, that is all Jesus needed to do. He didn't need to have a boxing match with the devil. All he needed to do was... Resist the devil. But I want you to notice the rest of the scripture. It says, come near to God and he will come near to you. 
Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. How do we purify our hearts? Ephesians 5 from verse 25 to 26 gives us the answer. It says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her, other versions say purify her, with the washing of water, by what? By the word. You see, it all boils down to the word of God. The word of God is able to wash away that filter of doubt. The word of God removes the filter of doubt. So what is it that you are doubting this morning? What are those doubts that have been plaguing your mind this morning? What is it that you've been questioning over the last 18 months? Because even as we begin to lose loved ones, even as we begin to sometimes get ill, sometimes we begin to even question God. And as I say, doubt is the doorway to deception, and deception is ultimately the doorway to death. Are you entertaining those thoughts, those words that the enemy is trying to get into your mind, that the filter that he's trying to apply? So what are you doubting this morning? Are you doubting your identity? Are you doubting that you are fearfully and wonderfully made? Because that's what the Bible says. The Bible says that you are not, not a mistake, as Pastor Mel mentioned, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, that God even knows the number of hairs on your head. And sometimes, sometimes that is what the enemy does. He begins to get us to question our worth. Are we really made in the image of God? If we go to the word of God, we find that we are. Jeremiah 1 verse 5 says that, uh, you know, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you, I set you apart, I appointed you as a prophet to the nation. Are you questioning your salvation? You know, sometimes, even at times when we mess up, we can question, are we really saved? As I said on Wednesday, when you sin, it doesn't affect your salvation, but it does affect your intimacy. And sometimes the enemy can so deceive us that at times when we mess up, we begin to question our salvation. Are you questioning God's word this morning? Are you questioning the valid, validity of his word, the truth of his word? Are you questioning your ability to hear God's word? Are you questioning God's character? Just because something bad has taken place in your life doesn't mean that God is behind that. Because God is a good God. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Not plans to harm you, but to give you hope and a future. Are you doubting other people because of your past experience? Because that is what the enemy comes and he, he throws those things into our mind. What are you doubting this morning. It's time to remove the filter. Can we stand this morning? I wonder if we can just bow our heads and close our eyes. And I started with the filter of doubt this morning. There's three other filters we're going to be covering over the next few weeks, but I started with the filter of doubt because I believe that during this season, that's the thing that has really been plaguing our minds. It's the doubt that we've allowed to creep in. We've allowed Satan to slither into our minds and he's beginning to twist and constrict and almost suck the life out of us. And even as you bow your head and close your eyes this morning, I believe that God is here and he wants us to today remove that filter of doubt. And how do we remove it? Through the word of God. And so maybe you hear, and if you're really honest with yourself, you, you, you'd say, Pastor Ash, when you were speaking about those symptoms of doubt, 
I identified with a lot of those things. My life has sometimes been like a roller coaster. Just highs and lows, highs and lows. I've been so easily swayed, so easily moved, so easily manipulated by other people because of doubt. I've been experiencing so much of lack because of the doubts I have. Lack in relationships, lack financially, lack in my workplace. I've just been double-minded, uncertain. One day I believe this and the next day I believe that. Wavering in what I believe. And it's almost like there's been no stability in my life. My foundation has been very, very shallow. And if that's you this morning and you've been struggling with doubt, I want to pray with you this morning. And I want to pray that as you begin to journey with God, that you'll become so filled with the Word of God that the Word of God will begin to displace every doubt that you have, that every filter of doubt will be removed. And if that's you, I just want to pray with you this morning. I don't want to call you to the front. I don't want to embarrass you. But if that's you, I just want you to slip up your hand if you've been struggling with doubt. And I want to pray with you this morning. Thank you so much. I see those. those hands. It's nothing to be ashamed of. It's nothing to be embarrassed about. Because this filter of doubt creates a rea reality in front of us that doesn't really exist. We don't see life through God's eyes. We see life through the eyes of the enemy. And so, Father, even as I come before you this morning, Lord, I pray, Lord, that that, that filter and that spirit of doubt of every person right now will be broken in the mighty and the powerful name of Jesus. And Father, even today, Lord, we choose to stand on your word and we choose to believe your word that is able, Lord, to just remove this filter of doubt. And today, Lord, I apply the sword of the Spirit. And I pray right now, Lord, that you'll cut through every filter right now, Lord. That you would, you would demolish that stronghold, every stronghold over the mind right now. I break its power in the mighty name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you will come and that you would remove the filter. Remove it right now. Remove it. Come on. You who've been experiencing doubt, just say, God, come and remove it right now. Remove every doubt. And I just want you to begin to declare God's word over your life. Come on, whatever you've been struggling with, just begin to declare God's word. If you've been struggling with identity, you just begin to declare who you are, that what the scripture says about you, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. If you're struggling with questioning your salvation, just begin to declare that whom the Son sets free is free indeed. That God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes should not perish but have eternal life. If you've been struggling with doubting God, come on, just begin to declare who God is, that He is a good God, that He loves you. Begin to declare what Scripture says, not what man says, not what the enemy says. And so, Father, I pray for every person right now, Lord. I pray, Lord, that they will be so full of your word. I pray that even from today, Lord, you'll give them a hunger, a hunger to know what the scripture says. Not what man says, not what the enemy says, but what you say about them and what scripture says about you, Lord. And so pray, I pray right now, Lord, that we will be filled of your word and doubt will begin to leave. Every ounce of doubt would begin to leave, Lord. And as doubt leaves, faith begins to arise. And so I just bless you and I thank you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've really been struggling with doubt and you want us to continue to pray for you throughout the week as well, I encourage you, that connection card in front of your seat, begin to fill that out. As we prepare to take up our tithes and offering right now, you can even drop that card in the offering basket as well. At this time, we're going to prepare our hearts just to uh, take up our tithes and offering. And as a church, we believe in the principle of sowing and re reaping. If you're visiting with us for the first time, you're not obliged to give. But we believe that giving is an extension of our worship, that as we give, we give joyfully, we give cheerfully. And we, we don't doubt God in our giving. 
we, we believe that He is able to meet our every need and that He is a God who is able to multiply the seed that we're about to sow. And so let's pray at this time. Father, I thank you for this opportunity that we have, Lord, to sow into your kingdom. Thank you that it's an extension of our worship. It's because you yourself gave your very best. And so we choose to give of our, of our sustenance, of, of what you've given to us, because you are the one that gives us the ability to generate wealth. And so I pray for every person that gives right now, that you'd bless and that you'd multiply their seed and help them not to doubt you, not to doubt that you are their provider, that you are their source, but to trust you, that you are able to meet their every need. Every need. And so we just commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. You're welcome to come and give their baskets in the aisles. You're welcome to come and place your tithes and offering in the basket. So when in doubt, what's the key? Get your Bible out. When in doubt, get your Bible out. I trust that you won't forget that. Amen. Just a recap of the announcements. If you'd like to register for any of the upcoming events, please see Lorraine or Janine at the information desk. That's our discovery track and that's our men's outing as well. And kindly join us for some tea or coffee at the back as well. Also join us on Wednesday for midweek prayer. And our coffee bar is also open, so if you'd like to purchase a cappuccino or a latte or whatever it is, you're welcome to do that as well. Let's just close in prayer. Father, we thank you for these moments that we could have had in your presence. It's such a joy just to be found in your house, just to be encouraged, just to be strengthened by your word and by this, this time in worship as well. So even as we leave right now, we pray for safe travel, we pray for protection, we pray for an amazing week ahead, Lord that faith would begin to arise in our hearts like never before. Every doubt would be gone in the mighty name of Jesus. And so I pray for every person right now, Lord, that favor would go ahead of them and surround them like a shield. And so we plead the blood of Jesus over our lives. We thank you that your blood would cover and protect, protect us and that you'd have your angels in camp around us. And now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all until we meet again. And everyone said... Amen.